Welcome to the Josh Heisman Podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Josh Heisman Podcast. And this week, I am going to start off by doing something a little different. I want to encourage you, if you have been enjoying this podcast, whether you're watching on YouTube or you're listening uh, through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, etc., wherever you're listening to this podcast, do me a favor, share it on your social media, let your friends know about it, tell them that we're here and that every week we have great guests and we're having some awesome conversations about scripture, about ministry, about life, and things that I think will really help people. So when you share these episodes, it helps the podcast grow, and it reaches more people, and it helps more people. And a perfect segue would be, I got a good friend of mine here today. His name is John Yancey. He is the pastor of Lighthouse Christian Fellowship in Antioch, Tennessee, which is right there. Nah, just like us, Brentwood, Nashville, Antioch, Hi. it's right there on the board. How are you doing? I'm doing well. It's yeah. good to be here with you. Good. Hey, pull that a little bit closer to your face. And uh, we have been friends for several years. And it's funny, when you just came into the studio, you said, last time we were uh, doing something like this, it was at Judd Granzow's uh, radio show, and right. that was way back. That was... Yeah, the P3 Man Up, or the whatever. The P3 Man Up Hour. Man he, Up Hour, yeah. That he recorded yeah. downtown, and we, we yeah. went in there. That, was, that had to have been 2000. When, when was that? I would think 2017, something like that. Yeah, and we've kind of stayed in touch and, yeah. and talked to each other ever since then. And uh, and we, you and I were doing a uh, staying in touch during COVID. We had kind of a weekly phone call that we did sometimes or a Zoom call mm -hmm. just to kind of, because that was such a weird time that none of us had ever navigated before. It was. So. And, and uh, the questions were very detailed. They were, so what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's your elder board saying? Yeah. How are you guys handling this? You right. know, talk right. about crazy times. Yeah. Man. And you made it through. We made it. We survived. We're still around. We did. So. And I'll I'm say, still around. I will say not another one though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, if something like that happens again, I'm hoping that everyone who walked through it will have a little more wisdom Yeah. Uh, in, in handling it. Uh, Definitely. Without the knee-jerk reactions. Yeah, those, so. those were definitely interesting times. So you've been the pastor at Lighthouse since 2009. Correct. And you're are you from Nashville originally, or how did that come about? L little bit of story. Uh, I grew up in Northern Virginia mm -hmm. and uh, started walking with the Lord when I was in college. Coming out of college, I got very involved in church, and God did that thing. It was more like he got his hooks in me and drew me in. It wasn't just in a moment that I heard him call, but he just kind of drew me in to where it was irresistible. I, I needed to follow him in a much deeper way. I needed to serve him. And uh, my pastor recommended I go to seminary, went to Fort Worth, uh, to Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. And while there, I got involved in a uh, inner city street ministry, and we were just radical idiots, you know, <laughs> fools for Christ. But we really just wanted to do whatever God said to do. And so we somewhat discipled one another, which is good in one sense, because our passion drove us on and our hunger for scripture. We probably would have done better to have some older, wiser guys uh, mm. to guide us through. But did that for five or six years, actually moved into a rescue mission, lived with homeless guys for a while. And uh, along the way, a number of things happened, and ultimately I knew that I needed to be a pastor, and I was called to a church here in Nashville. It was kind of a sister church to a church that I was involved with in Fort Worth, and came here in 1991 to pastor. Mm. And so it was a startup church back in the days when uh, no one in uh, Southern Baptist life was doing contemporary worship in small groups, and we were really the first church in Nashville doing it. So we were viewed a little strangely uh, by, the, uh, uh, by a lot of folks, but it has obviously become just such a natural part uh, of everybody's worship. But I was there at Hope from 1991 until I, we merged with Lighthouse in 2009, which was, that's a story in and of itself, is merging two churches. Yeah, so you might have mentioned this, and forgive me if you did. Were you the founding pastor of Hope? Or? I was not the founding pastor. They had they had actually brought uh, in a young man, a little bit older than me at the time. I was 32. And uh, they'd brought in a guy. And after six months, he realized, I'm not called to be a pastor. Mm -hmm. And he went back into a more of a ministry missionary type position. And so they did a pastor search. And 
we had a bunch of guys that I had uh, discipled and mentored that had come to Nashville for the music scene. Uh, you know, every, everybody, uh, you know anybody that plays guitar and sings, uh, I, Josh? I, I think we'd be better to say, do I know anybody who doesn't <laughs> right. play? You know, we, I, I still remember the, the guys that would visit church and, uh, you know, we were a young church at the time and guys would visit and, and you, you'd say, oh, so what do you do? Well, I, I'm an architect. Oh, really? Go, pause. But also write a few songs. <laughs> you <laughs> yes. Know. And, uh, and you just got to wait for it. Yeah. You, you yeah. know it's coming. Yeah. You, you just had to leave some space in the conversation for them to yes. fill it in. But anyway, these guys knew me. And when the church, it was a small church, you know, 65, 70 people. And uh, they said, uh, hey, you ought to get in touch with John Yancey. And so... Uh, they did, and the rest isn't history, but it is my story. It's kind of yeah, yeah, and that's that's fascinating. You say then in two thousand nine that hope merged with right. Lighthouse, and I, I think for someone listening, that had to have been a pretty tricky situation, right? It, when churches merge, it, was it, that a, it, it a is, challenge or yeah, it's a challenge. It's it's also good. I think we did it reasonably well. Uh, what happened was uh, Lighthouse was. Moving toward a transition, the founding pastor, Al Henson, was ready to move on, not not out of our—he's still a part of our church, uh, but to do more ministry overseas, mm -hmm. and you really can't be doing both. You can't be pastoring a church and spend a third of your time overseas. Mm -hmm. And so he had been trying to raise up a successor, and there were some young men who really were great guys— but they all felt the tug to go overseas. And so all of a sudden, it's like, well, what do we do? I was in a prayer group with other pastors, and uh, we were in a situation as a church where we had been in rental facilities the entire time I'd been there. We'd never been able to purchase property. We'd never, we were a bunch of young, poor guys, <laughs> you know, not much money. And so what kept happening with us is we'd be in a rental place for two or three years, and then the place that was running to us would say, you know, we've got a new tenant that wants to be in here full time, and we'd get bumped. Mm -hmm. And this kept happening to where we were starting over in a new location every three or four years, sometimes every two years. And so uh, in talking with Al, he, he actually proposed this idea. He says, have you ever thought about merging churches? And I went, no, because mm. I'd heard of, I'd only been familiar with one church merger, and it had not gone well. Uh, and so I was really hesitant, and he asked me again, and I thought, you know what? I need to take this to uh, our elder team because it's not my place to make a decision for the entire church body apart from involving them. And I'd never, I had just kind of dismissed it. And when I took it to them, they said, let's pray about this. Mm -hmm. And over six to nine months, we met with the, the elders at Lighthouse and we talked through it and we made the decision uh, to go forward. Now, what is, I think, most fascinating about it, I think when you merge churches now, it's like uh, a blended family. You're bringing two different sets of DNA together, even though you might think, oh, we're pretty similar you know, the way Al leads mm -hmm. and the way I lead, uh, you know, when you came uh, to to succeed, I think you were here as a youth. Yeah, minister, I was right? here for youth for from 2006 until 2013. Yeah. And then we, made, we started making the transition. Which is a great way to do it. But even with that, every church, when you change leadership at the top, I've realized it involves a DNA change. It does. And so we had to go through that whole thing, and uh, and it's emotional change. It's people. It takes years of a process for people yeah. in the congregation to say, "Am I on board with this or not?" Those who say in the beginning we're on board with this, a few years later go, "Actually, we never were on board." They just didn't know it, and there's no hard feelings in that, right? It's just it takes time when you make big changes like that. My preaching style is different from Al's. My mm -hmm. leadership style, my personality is different from his. And so, yeah, you would find people from uh, Hope who would feel like this isn't, we liked Hope the way it was. Yeah. And then people from Lighthouse, we liked Lighthouse the way it was. But I really think the best thing that we did is we stayed the course. We tried not to make massive changes and just to love people well. And over time... Uh, Mm -hmm. We did become, you know, one heart, one mind, mm -hmm. but it took time. It it does. I remember years ago when when I was going through that change, and we were doing the leadership change at New Hope. Neil Anderson, who yeah, uh, I know Neil, uh, yeah, author in town, but many people read his books. He, I had a, a great 
chance to sit down with him and he, he wrote this little chart for me. He's like, this is what this is going to look like. Because no matter how great you think this is going to go, there's things that are going to happen that you just can't anticipate. You don't know how people are going to feel. And he wrote this little chart and I, I, I wish I could do it for you, but he basically said over the course of this amount of years, here's how this is going to play out. And he, I wish I'd have had that chart. <laughs> oh, it was, it was so, now I will say this, when he drew out the chart, for me, he's basically go. It takes three to five years for yeah. people to come to a place where they're going to decide if they're either on board or not. And here's here's how it's going to look. They're going to have a dip here. It's going to come back up. It's going and, and before you know it, the DNA God's going to change that DNA of the church, right. regardless of whether you think we're going to keep it the same or we're not. I mean, it just takes time. And that experience of someone sitting me down and just kind of walking me through that before I had any idea was so invaluable and actually saved me from some heartache that when that stuff happened, I went, oh, he said this was going to happen. Yeah, I I remember even the first few years that I was at Hope. Now, I was in my mid-30s, but I remember thinking, there's just nobody at our church that needs counseling. Everybody's great, you know, (laughs) because no one came to me for counseling. Well, the guy that had founded the church as a visionary was still there, but he he was in the background. He wasn't trying to lead up front. Guess who everyone was going to? Yeah. with their needs yeah. because he was older, he was wiser. And I didn't even understand that that was happening. When I finally did, I realized there is a sense where people have to learn to trust you mm-hmm. before they'll come to you with what's really going on in their lives. And so I was better prepared when we merged churches to realize that you know, the people that have known me for years, that's no problem. But the people that don't know me are going to have to learn mm-hmm. uh, whether I, they think I'm trustworthy. Yeah. I didn't think we were going to go in this direction with this, but I'm uh, happy we did because there were there were some things I learned along the way that through through hardship and trial and error and that kind of speak to what you're saying. Because, you know, you, you get put in a leadership position and you you want people to be able to come to you and trust you and share things with you. But it takes time to build that yeah. trust, and it also takes gaining some wisdom and experience in the position so that they can know that, hey... That, that you is, really are trustworthy. That you really are trustworthy. And I've had a, a couple different times when uh, we might have had some staff come into the church and say, hey, I want to be in that position. I want to be the trusted guy. I want to be whatever. But in the back of their minds, they knew they weren't going to be here that long. Yeah. Not even the people. They knew they weren't going to be here that long. And so you can't, if longevity is not part of this as well, gaining that trust and people knowing, hey, that person, they're they're going to do life. Yeah. They're going to walk with me in, in a pastoral level in this. And and you've, you know, 2009, you've been at uh, with Lighthouse, but even before that, you were with Hope. I still consider myself to a pastor at one church. Yeah. Because we merged. And uh, so I... And I'm not saying every pastor should feel this way, but I see myself as a lifer. Mm -hmm. It would take a very clear call of God for me to move because I think it is a sacred trust when people do learn to trust you. When you're their pastor, you're not just the CEO of a corporation Mm -hmm. and easily replaceable. You're someone who has... uh, Right now, I am doing weddings and baby dedications for people who I did their mm-hmm. uh, mar- did their parents, you know, marriage and baby dedication. And, baby dedication. and it's it's another generation. And so there is, I think, great value in longevity. There, there's certainly great value in bringing on new blood, but we need to figure out the... 100%. But in, I think it's stability. Yeah. One of the things I've loved is even those who maybe have, have stepped away and they are, are going to other churches. I was... When I was a youth minister, I had a lot of kids who raised... Now they have families of their own. They're in church in different places. That's great. They'll come back and visit, and I can give them a hug, and how are you doing? But I love the fact... You know, I've been here 17 years. Yeah. I love the fact that they can come back and know, like, there's some stability there. Yeah. That I can go back and see and visit my childhood and visit those who are helping me and discipling me and and raising me up in the faith, and and that's equally as powerful to me. I think it's so valuable... Uh, you know, we have we hear so much about uh, this generation and in the last few years, a, a hunger for community and a hunger for for uh, experiential, tangible life connected to other people. Mm-hmm. And so uh, we're seeing uh, 
as they're building new properties, they're trying to do it to facilitate community. But I think church is extremely valuable in that when you're someone that people in the neighborhood, people that within 5, 10, 15 miles when they go, I need to talk to somebody and I know, I know Josh. Mm-hmm. And I can go to him. I can talk to him. I think there's so much value in that because stability and trust is not, you don't get that in in a moment. Yeah. And it's powerful for others who are in leadership positions. Like I know where you are yep. as far as a church, you know where I am. We have other friends in ministry who have been serving for many years and and uh, almost like lighthouses. Hey, I'm taking your church. There you name. go. There you lighthouses go. right there in the community where you know I have friendships, and we can go back to those times of COVID and when we talk to each other. And, yeah. And the relationships have been built, and there's stability there. So I think there's power behind that for sure. Yeah. Man. It's, so so total. So Hope Church started when? What year? It started, I believe, in '88. I went there in 91. early '91. '91. I was in eighth grade, John. You're just, you know, <laughs> wet behind the ears, <laughs> youngster. Yeah. Okay. I just had to throw that out there. You're, but... you're either condemning yourself or condemning me. I'm not I, sure I, which way to take that. So. I don't know. Okay. So that that was really cool with as far as uh, calling into ministry and how you got to Lighthouse. And so with that amount of time, you've been preaching for a while, and this is a lot of Christmases now that you have been preaching, yeah. okay? So as you go into another Christmas season and delivering messages, is there anything you've learned over the years about Christmas messages or a way you approach the season that's different maybe from the rest of the year? Yeah, it's definitely different. And uh, I've settled into some things, and, and not settled in like I'm locked in, but... Uh, I don't know if you experienced this when you moved into the seat where you're the one pastoring or preaching every week, but my early years of preaching, uh, I didn't hate Christmas, but I hated preaching the Christmas message because I felt stuck. Mm. You know, it's like, what can I say? You know, and there was almost a feeling of there's nothing new under the sun, uh, I just keep preaching the same passages, and I didn't enjoy that. So I would always look for what's a fresh way to to come at this, because familiarity, while it maybe doesn't breed contempt, it certainly breeds boredom. (laughs) And and so the minute that we bring out the passage in Luke, and we say, in in those days there were shepherds keeping watch over their flock by night, you know, that everyone in the congregation is going, oh, I remember, you know, when Linus read that in the Charlie Brown Christmas. Yes, yes. And it's very familiar, and it used to bother me, and it has completely changed. I now embrace it in the same way that I embrace the Lord's Supper. I look at it as familiar text and familiar truths that need to be that people needed to be reminded of, mm-hmm. not not for me to have to figure out a, a new and clever way to talk about. Yeah. That's it's fascinating because I understand what you're talking about. And you don't it could be jarring to some people to hear pastors talk like yeah. that. That when you get into the season and, and I think I've put my finger on why it can be a struggle and what you're saying is you're stepping into people's traditions yeah, and memories they have from childhood and messages. You, you, you start listening to Christmas music, which every, nearly every Christian Christmas song is telling the right. same stories and, and the, the passages of scripture that whether you're going through, you know, Matthew, Luke, John of, that have the Christmas stories, or you're going into prophecy from the past. I mean, these... So, so it's on blast in everyone's face for a month or two. And then you, as a pastor, you feel this pressure to go, what, what new could I bring to this? And then if you try to step into something new, that butts heads with someone's tradition where they just want you to bring. Have you ever, ever heard someone totally rework a Christmas song and you heard it and you went, Oh, I don't like that because <laughs> you like what is familiar. Yes. Yeah. So we, we have that happen. And just like you, so I'm glad you said this, I realized, wait a minute, but that's what I love. I, I, I have traditions and I have things that I love at Christmas. And I, and this, this time of year, those familiar passages of scripture, the assurance of the arrival of Christ, all those things, I don't have to reinvent this. Right. In fact, we love returning 
to the greatest story ever told. And why not give it to them? <laughs> I, I think one of the problems I have is really uh, we all have our own idiosyncrasies, and I'm, I can be quite ADD to where if I'm watching a TV show and I've seen it before, I can, oh, I know what it's going to say, and I can let, let me go find something else. Or if I'm reading a book and, oh, I've read this before. And so there's probably, there was a fear in me that everyone's going to tune me out because I'm just saying something that they'll go, I already mm -hmm. knew that. But we started doing, probably 20 years ago, we started doing Advent as a way to uh, remember the, the Christmas season. And we've done the same four weeks. You know, the uh, last week was hope, and then mm -hmm. we do peace, and then we do joy, and then we do love. And it was not a part of my tradition growing up, so it was something new. Mm -hmm. But And we do the same readings. We might modify it a little bit. We light the Advent wreath, and we started doing it as a church, started involving families and getting their kids to do it. And I started thinking, this is something we just celebrate together. We walk through. And so you were asking about, like, preaching this year, I'm preaching literally the four messages. I'm preaching the message of hope, the message of peace, the message of joy, and the message of love. I, and I do that not every year, but I don't mind going back to it. And I obviously, I change it up a little, but you know, this week I'm doing peace. And the same time I'm doing peace, I have people that I counsel with that are living lives of anxiety, stress, worry, and you go, what is God's antidote mm -hmm. for all these things that people are asking me to speak into their lives? And uh, the this year, not, not necessarily every time, but when I preach peace, and, and you obviously would know this, and everybody knows that the Hebrew word for peace is shalom, but most people whether they know it or not, they think of peace as the absence of something, the absence of conflict, the mm -hmm. absence of, of stress. And yet in the Hebrew, the word shalom really has to do with everything in its right place, with things being whole and, and in order. And so you realize that Jesus came to put things back in their right place. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I... The thought that I have on this is I'm not overly emotional, but there's something that always gets me, and that's when there's a good story that reels me in, and I get to the end of the story, and it works out the way it's supposed to work out, and there's something in me that resonates, and, and I will get choked up, and I think it's because there is a longing in my heart for things to be right. Mm -hmm. And when I see the message of peace, I see a God that going all the way back to the fall of man said, I'm going to make things right. I'm going to get things back the way I intended them to be. And the sending of Jesus and, the, you know, the Prince of Peace, the wonderful, uh, wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the Prince of Peace. It's like, I am going to make it right. Yeah. And it. It's amazing how, you know, even you think about the word Emmanuel, yeah. God with us. And when you just stop for a moment and, and you think about how, how does Jesus bring us peace? And to me, it's just wrapped up in that. God became flesh and dwelt among us. Emmanuel, yeah. God with us. So when you're sitting down with someone counseling, and let's just be honest, because neither you or I are exempt from having emotional breakdowns right. as well. What do we do when we're in those moments and we are, uh, need peace or, or we need the anxiety to lessen or stress right. to lessen, whatever it may be, is, is the reminder that God sent his one and only son, Emmanuel, God with us. He's, he's with, the, he understands. He is here right now. Yes. And, and, and if we just would stop for a moment and make, this is going to sound very cliche, Christmas is year round. Yeah. I mean, oh, really, absolutely. And un understanding that, hey, just because we threw up some wreaths and whatever, now we now we can pay attention to the fact that Jesus came. No, all every day. Right. He is with us. Yeah, and uh and in Hebrews, what he gives us a peace that surpasses all understanding. Yeah. And that that doesn't mean he gives us peace 
when we understand why that something's happening or why we're going through, no, he gives us peace that surpasses when we won't have understanding. Yeah. When we don't know why things aren't going the way we want, when things are out of control, when things are out of control, we have Christ. Yeah. He came and he's, he's you, with us. You know, you hit on, I, I think along with the Advent uh, themes, I think my favorite theme is what you just said, the Emmanuel, the, the picture of the incarnation. And in John 1, 18, where it says that he has made him known, you know, you go, all our lives, we really wanted to know what God is like. Mm. And then in Hebrews 1, it says that God in the past spoke to us through the prophets, but now in Jesus, we have the exact representation of the nature of God. And you go, you want to know what the Father's like? Mm -hmm. Look at the Son. Mm -hmm. And I love that, that we have, we don't have a graven image, we have a living image uh, of what God is like in the person of Jesus. And I was just thinking through this yesterday, and I was thinking of all the implications of that, of when you look at what Jesus did, you look at Jesus turning water into wine at a wedding. You go, what does that teach us about God? The, the very God who created the world, created the universe, becomes a man, and he cares because they ran out of wine at a wedding. Mm -hmm. You say, this is a God who's intimately acquainted with our ways and cares. Yeah. Uh, I love that. It, it, it's powerful. And in the, the message that I recently did for uh, Christmas, just uh, coincidentally, was also peace at the center of the, yeah. the theme of it, is, uh, you know, I talked about a, a, a time when I was young, when I had a Christmas gift that I wanted really bad. It was, you, you remember Radio Shack, the store oh, Radio oh, Shack? Oh, yeah. yeah. And Tandy. They, <laughs> and they would, they would send home these catalogs. And I would open the catalog and I would circle the different things that I wanted from Radio Shack, whether it was a stereo system or a remote control car or whatever. And there was one year I wanted the Knight Rider remote control car. And I circled that. Did it, did it talk? <laughs> I don't know. No, that's part of the story. And circled that and wanted to get it so bad. And I, I so look forward to it. I was so excited about it. And I, 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 I just, I'm, I'm going to interrupt. I love your yes. story. But so in your mind, did you fantasize that you were David Hasselhoff? Oh, listen, <laughs> go back and watch this, this message, man. It, it's, it, okay. it, it was over the top. I thought I was Michael Knight. Okay. And, uh, you know, I get the, the present. And what's interesting is every Christmas, we also then get the, uh, what do you call it? The utility presents. You need your socks, you yep. get your underwear, yeah. you get you maybe a new sweater or jeans, a coat, whatever, you know. And so I got a coat that Christmas and all that stuff didn't matter because I was getting what I wanted, which was the, the Knight Rider car, man, yeah. you know, the and, Red Rider BB gun. <laughs> yeah. And so and anyway, I go out into the street and, and the car turned out just had an on switch, an on and off switch on the bottom that when you flipped it on, the wheels would start spinning. Right. Right. Well, I thought the remote would stop that. It didn't. So I put that car down and it just started going down the road. And I can't do anything about it. Oh, no. It's gone. Oh, no. <laughs> it was gone. <laughs> and, but the way I shared the story with the church was, you know what I was wearing? So that, that present turned out to be a dud, but I was wearing the new coat that I didn't want. And I'm, I grew up on the south side of Chicago where on Christmas morning, yeah. it's cold. There's yeah. snow on the ground usually. But I was warm. The thing that I didn't want was the thing that I was wearing. The thing yeah. that I wanted was going down the road and was useless to me. And I, I kind of, uh, the, the, to apply that was, I, that's how Jesus to me is, he's, we want the, the flashy we thing. We want the flashy thing and we yeah. want whatever, but, but Jesus knew exactly what we would need. Hmm. And a lot of times we, we so take Jesus for granted yeah. when, when he's really the one wrapping us, keeping us warm in the cold while we watch the things that, the fleeting things that we want drive down the road. You know, when you told that story, you said one little thing that just reminded me of just how we can get a wrong idea. Uh, it wasn't a wrong present or a thing didn't work out. But the entire time I was growing up, I had, you know, grandmother on my mother's side, grandmother on my father's side. And one lived near to us in Virginia, the other lived in New York. So she would send her presents. Mm -hmm. The one near to us would bring the presents. And sometimes she was there on Christmas morning. The grandmother... In New York, my, my father's mother always sent underwear and socks, you know, the utility <laughs> present. Mm -hmm. The grandmother 
in, in Virginia would, you know, get us the flashy and the cool stuff. So she was the cool grandma in our minds. And then probably 10 or 15 years ago, my dad just commented to me. He said, yeah, we always told Mamu to, you know, get you the socks and all like that. And we just had kind of made a deal that, you know, and I was like, Oh, I totally misinterpreted. You know, I just thought I had a cool, fun grandma and one that was just totally practical. Uh-huh. You know, but it wasn't that. It's So it's funny. My mother-in-law, every Christmas, gives my brother-in-law and I socks, like nice yeah. dress socks, okay? Uh, man, we look forward to it so much. Kevin, now. Kevin and I. Oh, yeah. As yeah. adults, like every year we're like, hey, where's Beth's Christmas presents? Yeah. You know, because we want those nice socks. And, you know, in our line of work, those things come in handy. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it's funny as a young guy, I was like, oh, I don't want, I don't, I don't want clothes, I don't want that stuff. Yeah. I, I didn't start wearing different color socks till I got married, John. When I got married, <laughs> I had I had two wardrobes, brown and blue. Mm. Every shirt was blue with blue jeans or brown with tan pants, and I didn't know that you could mix and match. And so it, it took a little bit of feminine touch to make me acceptable. I'm, I'm t- <laughs> to make you acceptable. Yeah, yeah. I definitely, I, I can, I can agree because I started getting those different color socks. I, I, I wore green today just because you know. Yeah, and I, for those of you watching, both Pastor John and myself get the standard issue. We pastor. have the, the, the cool vest. There's yes. The, yeah. This the, gets passed out at graduation at seminary. Just so yeah. everybody knows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So what scripture were you basing your peace message on? Or what are some things uh, you were bringing out? Well, I'm still working on it. I'm not like you that I get everything all worked out well in <laughs> advance. Uh, you know, it's it's funny because there are guys who are able to do that, and you might be. I, I know the theme I'm going to talk about, mm-hmm. but uh, if you're like me, yesterday I taught three Bible studies. Uh, and today I did a funeral. Tomorrow I'm preaching at chapel at our, our Christian school. So it's like I kind of know what I'm going to do, but it's not worked out yet. But you're, in answer to your question, I probably will use as my theme just the prophecy from Isaiah 9 mm-hmm. of the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. But we see it fulfilled. Again, it's like this is the promise and then when the angels speak to the shepherds, we, we hear the promise fulfilled, you know, peace on earth, goodwill toward men, you know, that Jesus has come and he is bringing shalom. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I will use those to bring out this theme, but I'm, I'm more just fascinated with the reality of how do we experience and you've already hit on it, Emmanuel, God with us, the very presence of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, the fruit of the Spirit. Mm-hmm. But if if you're like me, it used to be sufficient for me to tell people, you know, I would say, well, there it is, you know, read your Bible, it's right there. But recognizing that it's so hard for people to figure out how do I, you know, I'm battling stress, anxiety, how do I really connect? And how does this become real in me? Mm-hmm. So that is, those are the things I'm praying through and and wanting to talk through. But uh, I, no spoiler alert, you know. Oh I'm yeah. Not gonna, but we need to figure out how to appropriate this incredible gift that God has given us. Yeah, and I think going back to what we were talking about at the beginning of this, we don't need to reinvent the wheel of the story. No. I mean, there is great comfort in in knowing. That the God who was is the God who is and forever will be. Yeah. Right? And I think that's part of the thing when you get to this Christmas time, people in in those stressful moments and those anxious moments and things, what they are looking for and desperate for is stability. Yeah. That it's going to be okay. And I think with with God being with us and Jesus coming in the form of a, of a, of a child in Bethlehem, it, it reminds us that it will be okay even though it may not seem like it right now. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I was telling you before we started, you know, I did a funeral today, a 98-year-old man, a man who lived, uh, I was talking to his wife today, and the first thing she said to me when I gave her a hug before the service, she said, he was a good man. And I thought, a life well lived. Mm-hmm. You know, a man who, and his son and daughter who are, you know, mid-60s, 70 uh, early 70s, stand up and go, 
this man was my hero. And, and I just think how valuable stability is and the presence. Jesus brings peace, but he also brings peace through the community mm-hmm. around us. Yeah. My, my wife and I uh, attended a funeral earlier this week. And it was a funeral of one of her closest friends from high school. Oh, wow. And, and uh, uh, a lady named Rachel, who was just a, a, a few years older than, than us, wasn't even 50 years old, and she, cancer, got her. Wow. And, you know, her husband, Robert, uh, put her service together, and she had, has two young sons. And each of the, the sons and Robert were involved in this funeral service, full church of people who are paying their respects. The The visitation the day before was just crowded with people. Rachel wow. was so influential in so many people's lives and such a blessing to so many people. And in all of it, we, you know, we struggle because we do have so many questions of why. I mean, yeah. you know, why is she gone? We were praying and we were praying and praying that, that she would be healed. God, God took her home. And, and, you know, in that you have questions and, and, and uh, her husband, Robert, at the funeral, got up and sang a song called God is Good. Mm. And in the, the lyrics of that song, I'm telling you, now it helped that Robert has a very soulful, awesome singing voice. Yeah. But the fact that he was even able to sing yeah. and do it and sing God is Good in, in the midst of your troubles, in the midst of your... Like, here is a man who who's in the midst of this pain of losing his wife. And so you can't say, well, of course you're going to say God is good because everything's going good in your life. It's like, no, 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 this is, this is the lowest. And he's singing God is good. And, and if I, to to kind of pull this all together, God is good because God came down and dwelt among us because the entire theme of that funeral service was she knows Jesus. Yeah. So it's not the end, yeah. you know? He has gone ahead, John 14, and prepared a place for her. And that's why we sang God is good. And that's, what, that's why Robert... So when he was singing it, I, I, I just stood... I, I was like so moved by what he was doing. Yeah. It was just so powerful. And uh, again, I sit in moments like that, and I think those who don't celebrate Jesus, that he came, yeah, who don't have that, you know... Uh, that's, that's, to me, the epitome of no hope, no peace right. being lost. You know, you know the, w- because of the calendar, we separate Christmas from Easter, but the message is it's really, it's all one big event. And uh, so today, uh, I had no intention of sharing this story, but we're, we're at the graveside, and uh, my associate pe- pastor, who actually led the service and did an awesome Awesome job. I, I shared some of it, but Kevin did a great job. But he started the Graveside Service, let, read a few scriptures, and he, he was trying to drive home the point that uh, this is not the end. Mm-hmm. You know, this is not the end. And the Lord tends to speak to me in stories. He'll just remind me of something. And when my oldest son was six years old, I started reading the Narnia Chronicles to him. And uh, and he loved it. And he, he was the guy, he was the kid that loved a good story. And whenever I would get to the end of a chapter, Let, let's read another one. Let's read another one. And I got to, uh, now this will be a spoiler if you've not read <laughs> The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. But uh, there is Aslan, of course, the lion is the, the Christ figure in, in the allegory in the story. And there is a place where Aslan at the stone table is put to death to free someone else. What a, what a great story. What a great picture of Christ. And I'm reading the story to Joshua. Of course, he's grown up in our family. He's been at church. And I get to the end of the chapter, and it finishes. I finish the story with Aslan, the great hero, is dead. And I close the book, and I said, uh, we're going to stop there, and we'll read some more tomorrow. And I'm thinking, he's going to be—he's going to be just caught up in the suspense of just le- how can you leave the story right there? And I close it up, say, you know, that's all for tonight. And he just—I mean, his eyes—and he goes, he's going to rise again, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, 
And I made up a word that probably other people have made it up too, but I made up a word that every Easter I talk about being Easterized. And I realized Joshua had been Easterized. Mm. He did not see death as the end. And I thought, isn't that a great perspective for life when we've been so Easterized that in the midst of Rachel, uh, yes. Rachel, Rachel's yeah. death, you can still say, it is well with my soul. God is good because this is not the end. Yeah. Man, that's a good story. I, I like it. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And, and hey, that, hey, hey it just you don't have to mention me, but if ever you tell the story, just kind of put your finger up as a footnote. You know? I, I will do it. I'll say a friend of mine who, who rhymes with John Yancey told me this story. Uh, yeah. And I love that Easter eyes. You can go ahead and, and coin that phrase yeah. right there because I yeah. think it exemplifies it really well. Is that yeah. when you don't even see it, like that. It's just in your belief system mm-hmm. that this is not the end. You know, Romans 8 28. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just lived out. Yeah. And that understanding that uh, the goodbye for now, they're still alive and they're, but they're in glory with Jesus. And we're going to see him again. Yeah. So we, we're sad. We grieve. But hey. That's the, and and I think that's why we should also be sharing Christ with others. Yeah, and have that understanding that hey, we want we want to see the, the ones that we love, and that maybe I would say that to those listening at home, who is it out there right now who you've been praying for? Maybe God is putting it on your heart through this conversation to say it's time to to talk with them. Okay, uh, one more piece from the funeral today. Uh, Kevin, our associate pastor, and Kevin is a. Uh, uh, slow talking, deep thinking, wonderful brother from Alabama, but he he's always had a heart for seniors. And uh, years ago, he started going over to Hugh and Ann's home, and they were in their eight, or at least Hugh was in his eighties, and they developed a friendship. And when Hugh was ninety four years old, he said to Kevin, uh, "You know, I've never been baptized." Hmm. And that was the start of a conversation. And Kevin said, well, well, let's, let's talk about it. And then Kevin asked him if, if he felt like he had peace with God. And he said, well, you know, I, I don't know. And this is a man who had been in and around church his whole life, but there was an uncertainty. And Kevin, with a 94-year-old man, walks him through the gospel and says, if you're not sure, why don't we be sure? And Hugh prayed with him, surrendered his life to Christ. And, and when they were done, Kevin says, uh, well, Hugh, do you have peace with God? He said, absolutely. <laughs> right then. And so here we are three years later. Mm-hmm. And, you know, well, and Kevin got to baptize him at 94 or 95. And here we are three years later. It is, it's, it's, it's never too late. It's never too late while you got breath in your lungs. I'm telling right. you. Go ahead and do it. That's man. That's really cool. Isn't that a great story? It is. I definitely. I love it. And it just it shows. I mean, kudos to Kevin for yeah. taking those steps and having that conversation. It can be tough because when you're talking to someone who's your elder, yeah, in that sense, oh yeah, to to walk them through that. You know, hey, I, I just want to say one thing that more than likely everyone who's listening to your podcast knows the Lord. But I was just going to say, don't think that the lesson of that story is, I can wait until I'm 94 to get my life. <laughs> That's not the point. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Do it now. Yeah. All right. So in these next uh, minutes here, as as we, I will say, kind of bring this to a close, it is Christmas. If you can't tell by the wreath, the new... I see, I see this is just decked. decked I mean, have you ever just... seen so much decoration for yeah, a, a podcast I'm... in your life? I, we, we, we spare no expense here yeah. at the podcast. Um, anyway, so we did this last week. I had some of the other the guys on staff here at the church come on. I think I'm going to have some of the ladies who are on staff at the church come on and, and uh, give their picks as well. Mm-hmm. But we went through our favorite Christmas movies, okay. our favorite Christmas music, and I would be remiss if I didn't ask you. Okay. what? Let, let's do your top three Christmas movies Ooh. and... Uh, you can put them in no particular order, or you can order them, whatever you want to do. And I'll tell you what, I, I'll even go ahead and I'll, I'll do some new ones for mine. Okay. I, 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 I don't know that I'm going to have to think through three, but I, I'll do it this way. Okay. When I was a kid, I really could not sit through, I, I was ADD, I could not sit through a Christmas movie. Hmm. Just, it was too long. But I remember watching It's a Wonderful Life. And I had snippets of it, so I had pieces of the story. 
And somewhere in my early adulthood, I watched the entirety of It's a Wonderful Life for the first time. And I had at the end of it, shalom. I had the sense of that's the way it's supposed to work. And so that still is probably my favorite, I'll just say, old-timey Christmas movie because it brings to me the sense of things that God wants things to work out. Now, let's throw away the uh, theology of an angel getting his wings, you know, none yeah. of that. But It's entertainment. It's entertainment. But the story of a man wondering if his life mattered and then discovering that he had made more impact in his life than he ever could have imagined. Isn't that the way it is for so many people? They live ordinary lives and they feel like, you know, I've not been... I didn't fulfill my dreams to be, you know, <laughs> a pro baseball player or, mm -hmm. or, you know, Michael Knight or whatever it was. And we realized that a man like Hugh today, that his son says, that man is my hero. His ordinary faithful life made such an impact. And that's what I like about It's a Wonderful Life. Mm -hmm. So so that's okay, my number so one. Okay, so before you go to your next one then, okay, okay let me, I'll, uh, here's what I'll do. Instead of giving you my choices, I'll, I'll do commentary on yours. Okay, yeah, critique me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tell me why I'm wrong or the, why I'm right. The scene, okay, so I'll say this. Every Christmas, It's a Wonderful Life is on our, our family watch list, yeah. right? So we make sure that we watch it as a family. Right. We all sit down and watch it. The scene where uh, now, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm losing the black, but, but old man Potter, yeah. when he's sitting there and George Bailey's uh, uncle who works at the bank yeah. accidentally gives, leaves oh, the money. With I can't remember his name right now. Uncle Charlie, uncle, whatever. I, that's what, I want to say yeah. that's what it is. Yeah. Uh, and he leaves the money there and then Potter, P Potter sees it, sees it and, and he, hides it. And then he doesn't tell him. And then, right. and then that, that Right, you talk about spoiler alerts. We're giving we're giving away some hey, stuff. It's here. a movie from nineteen forty six or forty eight. So if you yeah. haven't watched it, if it's you your haven't fault. watched it, yes. <laughs> but yeah. By the way, Sixth Sense. Bruce Willis is dead the whole time. All right. So <laughs> okay. So here we go. Hey, wait. Just a quick comment. Did that movie not blow you away the first time you saw it? <laughs> <laughs> when you suddenly go, oh! At the end of six, I yeah. we sat in the theater. My friends and I, we had a whole row. We sat yeah. there for 10 minutes after the credits just rolled. Stunned. In just stunned. In silence. Stunned. Okay. Okay, wait, back to, back to the... Back to the whole thing. Okay, so yeah, so Old Man Potter hides the money. I mean, I'm... It's so funny how movies can make you furious at somebody. Injustice. Yes, yeah. of yeah. what's going on there and yeah. that whole thing. And how other people... Oh, this is a message. We can we can take this, okay? Yeah. Other people will steal our joy and steal our peace, mm -hmm. and and some and sometimes might even be toxic. Like Potter is a toxic Uncle character. Billy? Uncle Billy. Uncle Billy. I think that might be his name. Might be his Keep name. Going. Keep going. We should be looking this up Keep on the going. phone. But Potter is a toxic person. Yeah. Right. And the whole thing with George Bill. I mean, this is what sends him on this spiral. Yeah. You know, and in the story, and and thank God, you know, the story has a. A, a great conclusion, you know, but there are so many wonderful life lessons in that well, Christmas okay. story. It, it just let's let me do commentary on your commentary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Think about a man who had great dreams. He's going to travel the world. He's going to do big things. But out of a sense of loyalty and duty, both to his community and to his family, gives up his dreams to be a faithful man. And then he feels like it's all a waste, but it wasn't. And I just think of... So many people that I've talked to who had big dreams and think that life is about fulfilling the dreams. You know, just follow your heart and everything's going to work out. But instead, you have a man who chose faithfulness and love in, in the agape sense, not the romance sense, but agape. And everyone sees his innate goodness and sees his value except himself. Ah, oh, man, that's good. Yeah. I a hundred percent. There's nothing I can add to what you're saying. That's yeah. why I'm just I'm just responding and going, man. Other than I'm going to watch it again this Christmas. Yeah, but we need to ring a bell right now. You know, just for another angel to get just for wings. another angel to get the wings. So all right, all right. So that's your that's was that number that, one. That's or number, number one. Three? Number that's one. Number one. All right. Did any other come to mind as uh, as you're thinking? Because uh, as you're thinking about it, I'm going to go ahead and I'll throw this one out okay. there that that I I uh, painfully did not really elaborate enough on in my last episode. Okay which is the movie White Christmas that my family also watches. We, just, as, I grew up with that, watching that. Of, okay. And uh, just 
just with Bing Crosby in it, I love the fact that I'm supposed to uh, put put my to actually believe that Bing Crosby is a young army cadet in the in the, in the beginning of that movie that he's in his like teens or twenties. I yeah. don't even know. Yeah, him yeah. and Danny Kaye yeah. are are these young guys? They're not. They're not yeah. young. No, come on. Yeah. And then they you know they they go through their life, but the songs and the dances. I'll and the follow story. the old man wherever he wants to go. Come on, <laughs> look at you. <laughs> yeah. That's it. But when when they uh, another spoiler alert, but when they there are a couple moments again. It's that sense of shalom. Think this is right. When the snow comes and they open it up and you see the snow and and you know the old general is ready to go bankrupt and he, and his life just feels like it's wasted and all of a sudden the snow comes down and everyone starts singing I'll follow the old man and because we love him we love, we love and, him and, yep. and and I'm just sitting there and I'm I'm I don't want to cry but uh-huh. I'm sitting there getting choked up every time because yes this is an honorable man a good man and it's working out the way it's supposed to work out yes it's awesome and if you haven't seen it I will say this a few years ago we had an elder at our church who we had over who was he's uh, in his 70s he's and uh, he's he's down in Florida now I'm not going to say his name he knows who he is what's it rhyme with <laughs> <laughs> never mind okay and we had him over to the house we're like we're gonna watch white Christmas and he goes oh yeah we uh, we've never seen that before and I was like what that how have you not seen okay anyway so if you haven't seen white Christmas go ahead and watch I, I want to give a word of caution just not just for expectations. We had a couple over to watch White Christmas one time, and they were more urban, more cool, mm. more whatever. And it's an old black and white movie. The plot is like an old black and white movie. Yes. It's slow in developing. And they struggled with it a lot because they wanted action and they wanted yeah. snazzy, snappy dialogue. And that's not it. The power is in the story. And you've got to walk through the story with it. If you don't, you might get bored. Don't yeah, you don't that's a great word. You don't connect with with the fast pace of it. You connect you 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 need to grab onto one of the characters. Yeah. And basically is he a colonel? Is the the guy who owns the, the resort um it might be a colonel, I'll say a general General, maybe general. Yeah. Yeah. Like the general is one yeah. who you, you just, it's it's his story, really. Yeah. Well, and to be honest. Like a lot of movies, when you watch it the second time, you because re- it opens with the the war sequence, and you don't really know who the general. You know, he's mm-hmm. there, but you don't really get it. And then you watch it the second time, and you go, "Oh, this is a man who was loved and revered by his troops at the beginning, and then he disappears from the story until, you know, mm-hmm. it comes back around." Awesome. So, All yeah. right, Phil. So third and final. Okay, I, I gave you your second one. He did. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I was. I don't watch a lot of movies because of my attention span, but I'm gonna I'm actually gonna go cheap here because I think the movies that most resonate with me are the ones that I saw as a kid. Mm. Like Die Hard. <laughs> I was avoiding it. <laughs> yeah. Now you gotta remember Die Hard, I was no longer a kid. I'm okay. a bit older than you. So okay. yeah. Now I do enjoy a good die hard. But uh <laughs> and yes, it is kind of a Christmas movie, but a Charlie Brown Christmas. It's not a movie, oh. but a special. Charlie Brown Christmas. I love, again, it's the part of the movie where Charlie Brown says, can anybody tell me what Christmas is all about? And Linus steps up, sure, Charlie Brown. And he goes, lights? And then he reads from Luke 2. Mm-hmm. Or he quotes from Luke 2. And when he does that, and then it finishes, and suddenly the tone of, of the show changes, and then you hear th- the whole cast start going, Ooh. Uh, and it's like, if you're going to ask me favorite Christmas carol, Christmas carols, I like the way I heard them when I was young. And so that is my favorite rendition of Hark the Herald Angels Sing, is the Charlie Brown Christmas. Oh, that's so, good. Yeah, uh, you can't beat that. Yeah. You know, and... Uh, my my wife thankfully collect collected all those things when yeah. when uh, we started having our own kids and making sure we had all the Charlie Brown stuff and we had all the the different you know Rudolph was another one but yeah but we're we're Rudolph that's a different space than what we're talking yeah. about right yeah. now and but that's a fun space when your kids are smaller when later when you have grandkids that's a fun space mm-hmm. but but it's a totally different 
Um, yeah. And and I, I know I have used the Charlie Brown lights, please, in the actual messages. I'm sure you oh, probably I've have shown too. the clip oh, as, yeah. as my text. How, how, how do you yeah. not? Yeah. I mean, it's so powerful that yeah. you just can't. I mean, sometimes you want to recreate it. But somebody's already done it better. So, yeah. So, yeah, go so, ahead. so just, just do it. Go ahead and do that. So yeah. Hark the Herald Angels Sing from the Charlie Brown Christmas. That's yeah. your number one, huh? That, uh, you know, I love White Christmas. But uh, not a Christmas carol, but a Christmas song. But again, I like Bing's version. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I like. There's so many Christmas songs I like, but I, I'm. It's funny because I'm not a traditionalist by nature. But as a as I've gotten older, I do hearken back to hearing things that I used to hear in a certain way. You know how. Uh, Every artist comes out with a Christmas album and they, they rework a Christmas song and, and it is okay, but there's something about hearing the original, the one that you first heard that just stirs a memory going back to when you were a kid, mm-hmm. when, when uh, Christmas was special and you were decorating the tree or something like that. Mm-hmm. So my, my boys are like that, especially in fact, Jordan, who's, who's uh, producing this podcast, He'll, he's in the other room right now, but yeah. he'll be able to relate to what I'm saying. Him and him and Tyler are like this. I'll always play them bands who do covers of yeah. original songs, and it, they don't care. They will never like the cover yeah. more than the original song. I'll be the one go, this is cool. I like this one better than this. And they're like, no, no, sorry. That, that's no, play the original, you know. <laughs> there was one time I got fooled, and I can't remember what the group was, but it's because I had grown up with the cover. Oh, and okay. so it was the first one that I had heard. And so I'm like, oh, that's, and then I heard an earlier, early 60s version. I went, oh, oh yeah. Oh, that's the original. Yeah. So, well, my favorite Christmas artist. Okay. And, and I didn't ask this question last week, but since we're talking about this, and some of the people in church here are going to laugh when they hear it. It's, but it's, and not laugh for bad reasons, yeah. but because I always say this, it's Michael W. Smith. And the reason, and I'm going to encourage you to go listen, yeah. okay? He's put out in his career, which I think is over 40 years yeah. at this point. I don't know for sure, but it's early 80s for sure. So he's done five Christmas albums. I don't know that there is a current recording artist who does a better job of capturing a classic, full... That's a good challenge. Spirit, I'll do that. Spirit of Christmas sound. I'm going to play you a song when we get off here, okay. by the way. And, and uh, so you can see what I'm talking about with full orchestra and Christmas style of music and whatever, and just a huge sound yeah. of Christmas that captures that traditional feel. And, and anyway, so I wasn't going to say that, but I'm like, man, every time. So I just, I, every yeah. Christmas I make up my Michael W. Smith playlist of Christmas songs. I, I need to do that. I, cause I would, I would probably enjoy that. Now I'm going to tell you another thing that I do like, and that is, New Christmas songs that aren't just cheesy, but, um, you know, and over time they may, to some people, they may feel worn. But I remember when uh, Mary Did You Know first came out, you know, because that's not a, you know, 60 year old song. That's mm-hmm. about a 30 year old song. I don't know exactly. But I remember when I first heard it, I thought, Oh, what a fresh take mm-hmm. on a Christmas theme. Mark Lowry, uh, I think, wrote that yeah, song. Yeah, mm-hmm. And uh, another one that I remember, it was like 1982. So I'm dating myself. Were you alive in 1982? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, okay. I was. Uh, and how old were you? Uh, wait, I was in the... Uh, uh, in the what do you call it the waiting room the, where they put the baby when the baby's born no i was born in 77 so okay so you were come five. On now. yeah i i was i was uh, actually a relatively mature young man at the time but uh scott wesley brown who's from here in nashville uh this little child uh and i that song rocked me who would have thought this little child was who the prophet said will return Ooh, to judge the world the living yeah, and the dead i know that song yeah and i you know when i heard that song it grabbed me because it was a powerful take uh, on the Christmas story, and I love it. Michael Card. Is that the one yeah. that goes, and who would have thought, thought that this little child would... Yeah. Was born the king of kings. Yeah. Uh-huh. The son of just a carpenter and for whom the angels sing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh. It's going on my playlist. I yeah. got time. Oh, powerful song. And and at the end, he, he really... Uh, he 
And again, you go 1981 or 82, nation against nation, brother against brother, men so filled with hatred, killing one another, when half the world is starving and our banner of decency is torn, debating over disarmament, killing children before they're born, mm. uh, fools who march to win the right to justify their sin, every nation that has fallen has fallen from within. But in the midst of this darkness, there is a hope, a light that burns, this little child, our only hope, one day will return. Mm-hmm. You go, that's poetry. That's it, man. That's poetry, man. That, oh, that's what it's all about. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Okay, let's bring this to a close. And this has been awesome. I really appreciate you coming I, in I here. I enjoyed it. Thank you for and inviting I me. I have other, some other pastors coming in next week as well. And this is a, a busy time of year, a lot yeah. of stuff going on. So I really do appreciate you coming in and taking the time to be a part of this, okay? So... You and I, we talked about earlier, we would call each other during COVID, during times yeah. when it was difficult decisions. Yeah. Christmas Eve is on a Sunday this year. How are you guys doing it? We're just doing one service. Mm-hmm. We, we had originally planned... Now, it was initially complicated because we have language congregations that use our auditorium. And we were trying to do our... Sunday morning service, and then we do a Christmas Eve service normally us, in the evening, us too. the night before. Mm-hmm. And so we were juggling and trying to figure out when can we get in, and we were, we were really caught up in it. And then we just decided we're just going to do the our, morning. Our Sunday morning we're service. We're going to do our Sunday morning service, but we're going to do it with more of the elements of our uh, normal Christmas Eve service. Uh, we're going to, you know, we probably won't do it the whole service, but we may start like a regular Sunday morning service, but we're going to finish with the candlelight and, and reading from the Christmas story and finishing with, you know, Silent Night and, mm-hmm. and things that we always finish with just the, the, the sweet uh, familiarity. Aroma, familiarity, the aroma of yeah. Christmas. We're going to finish that way. I love it. We're doing the same thing. And, yeah. you know, every year on Christmas Eve, Last year, Christmas was on Sunday morning, Christmas right. Day. And yeah. the question that everybody, are, are we still having church? Because we're having the Christmas Eve yep. service, and then yep. we're having... And uh, last year, we didn't have a Christmas Eve service in person because three pipes burst in our building. I in, remember... In three different y- y- places. You posting that. And... Uh, you guys must must be... You know, we have and, taken precautionary efforts to make sure that that does not happen again, because that was a disaster. So you got heat under the building or whatever, or what? What <laughs> do you got? How do you take precautionary... We've lit, in, we've lit in bonfires all around the building, and we're making sure they don't hit the yeah. building itself. No, we've, we've gotten all that fixed. It took a full year to yeah. get everything back back in shape with the kitchen and all, all the different places in the building. But this year... We uh, were here on Christmas Eve morning, and we looked at that too. We're like, should we do the five o'clock? Should we? Right. Because we normally do a five o'clock in the candlelight. It's dark here in Nashville around three p.m., <laughs> and so it's dark. You know, and that's that was the only pushback, and and I get it because I'm I'm traditional in this as well. People, it's still light outside. How can we light candles if it's light out? You know, and it, you know what? We don't have windows in our auditorium, so uh, it'll be dark. So you're good to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So and I get that, and and my response is, hey, every seven years, listen, this is just yeah how it's going to be. But next year, we'll be back and better than ever. Yeah. But we're going to do the same thing. Like what we would normally do on a Christmas Eve service, we're going to bring that into our Sunday morning yeah. worship time. And, yeah, and, we're, and we're going to probably be a little shorter mm-hmm. than, and, and just make it a family Christmas service together. Um, so I, it took me a while. I was the guy who was fighting for how can we make this work? And then I finally went, we don't have to do that. Yeah. yeah. Got to tell you something funny. So yeah. last week I had Pastor Austin here. He was sitting on my left here. He's in the production studio too, so he'll laugh at this. We were talking about our favorite Christmas memories. And he's like, I used to love the midnight service when we would get there at 11. And he goes, but now that I'm on a church staff, I'm not like saying we should do that. <laughs> <laughs> he was, I know he was hoping that I wouldn't be like, we should do that. You, you know, the first time I really, it wasn't so much a service, but I was on a mission trip to Peru. Uh, in 1988, 1988, and uh, everything happened at midnight. You mm-hmm. would have a big meal and the opening of presents and like that, and and it was pretty cool. I don't want to do it, but I enjoyed doing it as a part of their culture, and it, it was really significant for everyone to kind of look forward to getting together at midnight. Yeah. So uh, but good for them. Well, good for them is right. <laughs> you all have a great time with your midnight stuff. But yeah. So anyway, we're on the same page. So yep. Lighthouse and New Hope are doing the same thing. Great minds. On the Sunday morning. Great minds. Thing. Hey, thank you for being on here. 
appreciate it. This was a, a, a fun conversation, and uh, I'll be praying for you and the messages you got going on. You be praying for me, and amen. And, and we'll uh, we'll go there. So, thank you everybody for listening once again. Uh, please share the podcast with your friends, family. Uh, social media, all of those things and help us grow this as we're going to have more great guests on who are just here, like just like Pastor John. So thank you so much. And we'll be with you another episode next week.